Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Smooth sailing. Wouldn't it be nice if life was always smooth sailing? A while back, I was in my truck on my way to Scott and White in Round Rock to make some visitations one afternoon. And as I was going along, I hit the scan button on my radio. I was hoping, since it was around 5 o'clock, to catch some news. And as the radio was flipping through the stations, I, it came across a Christian talk show. And there was something about the conversation that was taking place that caused me to select that station. There was a woman who had called, called in. She, her name was Stacy, and she was explaining to the talk show host that she was going through a lot of problems in her life at the moment. She had had a lot of problems with her boss and later wound up getting laid off. She had problems with her husband and was worried that their marriage might wind up ending in divorce. She had problems with her teenage son from another marriage. She was struggling with bouts of depression. Finances were really tight. And she was going on and on, relating this long litany of, of troubles and problems and woes when all of a sudden the radio show host, he interrupted her. He said, Stacy, I want to ask you something. Are you a believer? Because if you aren't a believer, I'm just going to tell it to you straight. You won't be able to solve any of your problems. So Stacy, are you a believer? Now Stacy hesitated. She was like, I, I, I don't know. Well, come on, Stacy. If, if you're a believer, you would know it. Come on, are you a believer or aren't you? Well, I'd like to be, she said. But I guess at this point in my life, with all these issues going on, I, I guess I'm more of an agnostic. Well, now, this radio talk show host, he eagerly rose to this bait. He said, Stacy, I want to tell you. And here's when he said exactly what I was anticipating him saying. Stacy, I just wrote a new book. And I want to send you a copy and then he goes on to explain how myself and anyone else listening could obtain a copy, purchase a copy of his book. And Stacy, if you read this book, then you're going to become a believer. And you will have all the faith you need to fix your problems. You just need to believe, Stacy. You just need to believe a little harder. And then the seas of life are going to become a little calmer for you. A little more faith will give you some smooth sailing, he said. If only things worked that way, right? If only a book and a little more faith really could cure everything that ails us. Indeed, maybe Peter, from our text this morning from Matthew 14, maybe Peter should have re read that book. Maybe then he would have had enough faith to actually walk on that water rather than so infamously sinking. In fact, if you think about it, Peter shouldn't have needed any book at all. Any real help at all. I mean, after all, he and the disciples had just come from the Lord God Almighty in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Just a few hours before this, they had seen what Jesus could do with just five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. They themselves had been filled up by that very meal. They themselves had received his powerful word. Indeed, life couldn't have been more smooth sailing for them. And yeah, how good it is when life is smooth sailing. When our family is healthy and when the marriage is strong and, and when our finances leave plenty of room for not only saving but, but also having a little fun along the way. In times of health and prosperity, it is easy enough, I think, for anyone to say, oh, I am blessed. And it's easy to praise the God who blesses us. But what has happened to our faith when difficult times come along? What happens to our faith in God when the winds of change blow our way and the waves of trouble break around us when the seas of life become choppy? You know, I don't know that much about seagoing vessels from ancient antiquity, the first century, the kind that the apostles would have been on on that Sea of Galilee, but... I'm sure none of them had their own flotation device, okay? I'm sure it was pretty much row for all you were worth or drown. 
The sea of Galilee can get rough really quick. And not only that, it was nighttime and everything seemed scarier at night. The wind was strong, the waves were high, and it doesn't take much to turn over a boat. Their oars were no match for the strength of the Sea of Galilee. And so what might happen? One more wave could be the end of them. And to top it all off, Jesus wasn't with them, right? They had left Jesus. Or maybe to even make matters more confusing, Jesus is the one who actually sent them out here in the first place. I mean, they'd been around Jesus long enough to know that he knew what he was talking about. He didn't make mistakes. He knew what the the morrow held. Why would he send them out in this lake if he knew this storm was coming? Shouldn't things be smoother on that account alone that the Lord had sent them? For Pete's sake, right? Literally, for Pete's sake. But where was Jesus now? Fear grips the disciples out there in the midst of that sea. They find themselves literally in the shadow of death. And yet the Lord was still very much in control. If there was ever any doubt, the very same Jesus who allowed these rough ways to touch their lives now came to them walking on that very same troubled water. Jesus had allowed these troubled waves to touch their lives, but now he was using these very same waves to provide them with his presence. The same Jesus who had once calmed a storm with a word now was using this storm as a pathway by which to come to his followers. And yet, they didn't recognize Jesus when he worked that way, did he? How strange it is that God works sometimes, even in the difficult things of life, and sometimes we don't always recognize it as such. Indeed, they thought he was a ghost. They get more afraid. Until, that is, Jesus speaks to them. Take courage, he says. It is I. Don't be afraid. Words of comfort. Words of presence. Words that made an immediate impact on Peter. I mean, Matthew tells us that Peter, he immediately does what is clearly impossible. Unimaginable, even. He walks on water. Christ speaks, and Peter is enabled to walk on water. Jesus simply speaks his comforting, beautiful, powerful word. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And you know, as you read through the narrative, it doesn't take us long, I think. It hasn't taken Christians long at all throughout the centuries to realize that in so many ways, this text is relating our lives Our lives captured in in 12 verses describing our spiritual walk with the Lord. Storms in life blow in from all directions without warning. We never know what each day holds. One minute it's smooth sailing and the next it's wind and waves. But how do we respond when the waves rise in life and the waters get troubled? When the phone rings in the middle of the night, or when the layoffs finally make their way to you, or when the doctor doesn't know what to say, will you sink or will you swim? Will we barely keep our heads above water, or will we be able to do the impossible? Guess what I mean is, when the storms of life strike, is it possible to do more? Is it possible to do more than just keep your head above the water? Can we rise above it? Can we overcome it? Can we even walk? On water. Now here's where I think we need to clarify something. Like that radio talk show host, there's a lot of false notions out there that are being preached and taught that if you have enough faith, a strong enough faith, then life will always be smooth sailing. Or that if you believe hard enough, God will bless your career. Or, or that if you believe strongly enough, God can even cure all that ails you, all your health issues that kind of stuff. We call it a theology of glory. It's basically just a focus on us. What we can do if we really try hard, right, really believe strong enough, we can rise to the occasion. If we just use what's within us, we can, we can take care of our problems. Oh yeah, God will help us, but, but always the focus is on us. And it's a theology that over and over again in the scriptures and even in our text today is proven false. And make no mistake, this message today here, too, is no self-help message. 
about how to get through the storms of life on our own, nor is it how we can make the most of a bad situation or, or find the silver lining in dark times. No, this message is about Christ and Him alone. He who gives us what we need in the midst of the storm. It's about Christ and Him alone who is our salvation. How Christ and Him alone is strong even when we are weak. And we always are. And how Christ and Him alone strengthens our faith even amidst and through the struggles we face. Yeah, today's message, I guess you could say, is about walking by faith and not by sight then. It's about how all things are possible through Him who gives us strength. Peter walked on water. He wasn't trying to show off. He wasn't testing to see if it really was Jesus. He wasn't demonstrating a bigger-than-normal kind of faith. No, he simply heard the powerful, comforting words of Christ, the peace-giving words of Christ, the empowering words of Christ, and the word of Christ enabled Peter to walk on water. The word of Christ enabled Peter to do the impossible. And with the words of Christ, so can we. No matter what we face, Jesus gives us the very same that he gave Peter. His sure and certain word and bids us to dare then and do the impossible. God speaks to us his sure and certain word every Sunday morning right here. And then he dares us to go out there and do the impossible. I mean, you've probably heard it, right? If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. Well, that's really just trusting the voice of our Lord. His words. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Notice, in this moment in our text, Jesus doesn't calm the storm first. Now, Peter, you can take courage. Now, Peter, it's okay. Now, Peter, don't be afraid. No, he allows the wind to continue raging all around Peter and all around those in the boat. It's not like it's the last time either that Jesus says, quiet and be still. <laughs> yeah, that had worked once, and the disciples were amazed, but now it's time for Jesus to work in the midst of the storm. You see, sometimes rather than calm the storm, indeed, our Lord would rather calm his people. And that's an important point for us to remember. Rather than always take away the storm and calm the storm, no, sometimes he speaks his word of power to us to calm us in the midst of it to give us what we need in the midst of it. And that's why Peter's actions aren't really all that extraordinary. He didn't do anything extraordinary. He simply heard the word of the Lord. And in that moment, nothing, nothing could stand between him and the Lord. Nothing could make him afraid. He simply got out of the boat and walked to the Lord because wouldn't you, if Jesus was out there and said, come, Peter's actions just showed a dependence on the word of Christ. Peter didn't create his own faith, and neither do we. We're not faith generators. You know what a generator is. It's what we pull out whenever the storm comes and knocks out all the power. We pull out our generator, we fill it with a little fuel, and then it runs for hours and hours and gives us all the, the electricity we need. But that's not us. We're faith users, not faith makers. <laughs> We're degenerate in faith, you might say. For you and me, the reality is that if Jesus doesn't calm the storms in life, we wind up wondering what's going to happen now. What if the cancer doesn't go away? What if the marriage still breaks up? What if, what if, what if? That's what we naturally degenerate to. <laughs> no, our Lord rather instead speaks to us so we can get out of that boat. That boat of whatever it is that we like to find safety and security in. And instead... He calls us to come to him. He bids us come. It's about how our Lord, this text is about how our Lord generates and works and creates the greatest faith in the midst of life's sharpest storms. It's how he gives us calm in the midst of the chaos. You and I really can step out in faith in life, even in the midst of the storm. You and I, we have the power based on the word of Christ to rejoice even in the midst of sadness, to dare to rejoice, to step out in faith and give even when we have nothing left, to step out in faith and serve even when our sinful flesh tells us our needs are the greatest. 
to step out and discover a Savior who not only commands the wind and the waves, but uses the very struggles we face as a pathway to come to us. That's walking on water. That's doing what in this world is often so impossible to find. Now, unfortunately, Peter, right when he was doing just that, Peter took his eyes off the one who really could sustain that faith, create that faith, generate that faith in him. And who can blame him? I mean, notice our text says when Peter got out of the boat, what did he see? He saw the wind, which is such a strange way of wording it because you can't see wind, can you? But you can certainly see its effects. The way it was picking up the water into those mighty waves. Peter started looking at those waves, no doubt counting the waves. And the more he counted them, the more he felt overwhelmed by them. I can't do this. How often do we do the same thing? We count waves in life, right? We count up all those headaches and heartaches that, that we see going on. And it's so easy for us to think the same. I'm never going to get through this. I can't do this anymore. How foolish we are. Oh, ye of little faith is right. That's us, right? What degenerates we are when it comes to faith. So don't count the waves. Instead, we're called to keep our focus on the one who commands them. Remember, the power of faith is not in how big or how small it is. The power of faith is in its object. The object of our faith is Christ. He's the one who said, I am with you always to the end of the age. That in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Or right here today, in the sacrament of the altar, he is the one who will say, take and eat. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed. For the covenant that God has made with you, for the forgiveness of your sins, take it and eat it and depart in peace. Yeah, in real life, no matter how far we may sink, sometimes sink into sin no matter how much fears may grab a hold of us and sink us in doubt christ is the one who can and does and he does it regularly find his way to us and reach out his hand of mercy and grace to pull us up he rescues even little faiths like us degenerates like us any faith that cries out and says lord save me he does it with an outstretched arm a nail scarred hand Remember, ours is a theology of the cross, not a theology of glory. It's based on what Christ has done and what Christ has given us. And he is the one who regularly reaches out with the grace that he has won on the cross and freely gives it to us, forgiving us and reminding us that he has already saved us from the darkest night and the fiercest storms. That through the wind and the rage of that first Good Friday shone the light of Easter resurrection. The same Lord who walked on water is the one who clearly did the impossible when he walked out of the grave. And if he defeated death, then certainly we can follow him through a storm. He lives. He lives to walk with you and me. No matter what may happen in life, we follow. We keep our eyes on him. That's all it takes to walk on water. In Jesus' name, amen.